Camilla, welcome back to this show, which is <laughs> our podcast at Exist Perspectives, um, where we have conversations with experts um, in research, science management, entrepreneurs. And um, we, we're very happy to have you here again. We've met before in this digital space and room for where we talked about your work. Um, mm. Um, where you're basically helping researchers um, to curate data. Um, and we talked about fair principles and conservational biology, which is your expertise. And we've also worked together. Well, you've done all of the work and I was just giving some feedback here and there um, within the Wikimedia um, Open Science Fellowship Program. Um, yeah, so now we're here to celebrate um, as a result of your work, um, not only to design a, a, should I say super simple or easy to use electronic notebook for computational and yes. research, and also paper that yeah. describes the very same. But yeah, mm -hmm. please tell us more about the journey, <laughs> how you're feeling now. Yeah. <laughs> Sure. No, yes. So first of all, thanks for having me back, for being the mentor of this work and also for the for helping um, spread it around. And um, yeah, so the idea of this paper, the idea behind my whole participation in the Fried Citizen uh, Fellowship was to, as the title of the paper says, it was to create a simpler way for researchers to organize the computational parts of their work. And this came from my own experiences during my master's and my PhD, because I had, I'm like many of my colleagues, so I'm a biologist, an ecologist, and then I got into writing code and writing, using other people's code. And they, at first, this sounds, um, it, it's, it's quite chaotic for us. We just grab pieces of code, put on scripts, run, get the results, put the results on papers, on presentations, and the whole thing over time can get a bit uh, overwhelming, completely mm -hmm. disorganized. And but also, those... like, I mean, it's, it sounds chaotic, sorry to interrupt, but it's also an iterative process, right? You, yes. you, you start from unfinished code, um, massage it, optimize it further, adjust it to your research context. And it's not meant to be perfect, but it's, it's to be cleaned in the process to be functional. Um, yes. So, yeah. So in a way it's part of the process, but also there's a need for some structure, some, yeah, to, to make it easier to manage. Which, yes, exactly. Yeah. So, and, and the, the thing, as, like you said, it's, it's not um, straightforward. It's not like we think of an analysis, run it, put the perfect get graph together and that's it, we publish a paper. No, we try many things. We explore routes that don't look that like they are going to, they're not clear at first and then we have to set, set that aside. And um, so this whole thing happened, at least for me, it was in the last 10 years during my master's and my PhD, which is what, where the, there was this boom of use in, of, um, in computational ecology where I actually, um, work where like it became more and more popular mm -hmm. and this is what I would see with me and my colleagues we would have a bit of a hard time organizing like really so day-to-day -day work of okay how do I where do I save my script how can I make that I don't have six versions of a single script uh, mm -hmm. so that I can save different versions script one to seven and then I have to read it through to know what's happening and um and at the same time, there are many tutorials available online, which is great because everybody, uh, it's, a, it's very much, there was very much this idea of a community helping itself. So everyone would write a bit of an introduction to, to organizing code and how to write document code and so on. But because of the, uh, still, the, 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 despite the, 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 this variety of tutorials, I would still come across the same problems of my colleagues, mm -hmm. um, especially those who are not uh, so much in the computational part of stuff, because I, I did my PhD 
um, in um, as at the University of Wurzburg, and and I was a, a student of the zoology department, but also mm -hmm. of the Center for Computational and Theoretical Biology. And there is where it was he it's heavily focused on computational um, studies or computational techniques, and this is where I came in contact really with what it is to work day to day with code and um, all the practices around it, because. I mean, you have software development uh, running for years, and they 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 have their own established practices in the in the in the market, right? So mm -hmm. the they have the the you have these huge teams and very secretive and important code that is running like there's money running on those codes. So the, mm -hmm. the, the, the those techniques they 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 how do I say they um, they pass down to academia. But not so much because the the academics they were they are not um, they are not computational sciences um, usually right of course they're mm -hmm. the, the computational sciences ones but we were um, taking some techniques from computational sciences and this is where I saw this whole world of how okay how you document code how do you work together with people um, mm -hmm. on the same code and how do you share how you document it and. Again, a variety of, of resources, um, of tutorials and so on. And I would still see there was the, there was this very specific occasion where I had we had this, we used to have this unseminar discussions where we would share common problems that we had. So it was a it was a moment for all the students, all the PIs to come together and talk about some some question that they had some interest that they had in common and one of them was how to organize a work and i saw that the, that there was a variety of strategies and none of them was perfect were perfect and people were still like yeah at some point i lose control and i have to rush for a paper and then things just get bundled up in a in a in a in a folder somewhere in my computer and then the paper is published and then i'm, I'm i get rid of it I mean, I don't get rid of it, but your your paper is done, and that's the the, the You're losing objective. track, uh, or basically it's exactly. somewhere archive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, it's like okay, the paper is out. Whoever reads the paper will understand the general idea. If they have questions, they come to me. But mm -hmm. I still, um, especially for the PhD and, and the the idea of the thesis of of writing a thesis that where everything is connected, and it's like a three to four year work body of work. So. I still would miss this continuity and this ability to track um, things. So I started to develop my own system and I presented it to, to my colleagues and everybody, uh, I mean, most people liked at the, even this, this first version, which was a complete mess. And they helped, they gave me ideas about how to make it more efficient and so on. So I polished it a bit. And then when the time, when I read the, the, the announcement of the, of the Francis Fellowship, I said, well, okay, this sounds very much in line with what I like, mm -hmm. uh, with what I'm doing, actually. And also, there was this, uh, the, during this whole process, there was this idea for me that I wanted to make my work uh, uh, as open as possible for it to be scrutinized. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, at least as a PhD student, you're like, okay, sometimes it's like, what am I doing? Is it correct or not? So I made it, I, I tried my best to make it as open as possible. So wherever there was, if there was ever a mistake or anything, people could see it right away mm -hmm. and check and so on. Um, so I, I said, okay, it, it would be nice to have some time and uh, some resources to dedicate, to make it in uh, something that I could share with others, right? Because those, those are my practices, my scripts. I would just run them, put them, put my my workflow together. Uh, but it would be nice to have the time to test some ideas and um, check if there was anything available uh, to improve it. Um, so, and this is how I I use this as my my basic project to apply for the Franciscan mm -hmm. um, program. And then when I got in, we got uh, all that mentoring in much, which opened my eyes for um for the world of open science even more and help me improve the 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 package in a sense to make it um more more how do i say 
more focused on what it could do because we can have all these practices of documenting work, publishing it, uh, documenting code, sharing code, and then you have different tools for it. Mm. But I think um, in the end, um, I didn't want to have a comprehensive tutorial for all of this because as I said, there is this big variety. Mm. I said, okay, let's be very specific and focus on the day-to-day -day work of a scientist that has a lot of things to do and also needs to start tracking the work because um, besides the, the, the question of this being a good practice of properly documenting and sharing your work, it becomes, it's, it has, it's become increasingly important with um, funding agencies and um, it, it, it's become a, a important item in, in research CV to see that they have share their code and their data properly and document it well and have it been reusable. And um, as I said in the, in the, the previous iteration of the, pro, uh, of the podcast, we are doing, um, it, it, it's, it's better to, 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 to waste time, so to say, thinking of new ideas and coming up with new questions than trying to reinvent the wheel that somebody, someone else already used. So as soon as we make it easier for people to share their code, and others can find it relatively easy and reuse it. We 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 put our 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 brains and our time to 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 better use. Great. So maybe if I if I may take you back to where you I thought I originally coming from with conservation biology, um, and now what's special about your personal career is that you merge with computational science. Yeah. And so what is the benefit that computational research is bringing into conservation biology? What, like, what's the leverage aspect? And how, like, which then eventually led to you coming up with this toolkit for a computational notebook. Um, yeah, and how do you envision this to be useful also for other disciplines or other research yeah, disciplines, really? Yeah. To, to further inform the research for computational analysis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just to be very specific here, just, mm -hmm. I mean, just some nitpicky is that I'm not so much of a conservational biologist so, per se. Mm -hmm. I was more into the theoretical part of ecology with some consequences for conservation biologists. The, just so that people don't think I'm yeah. working directly with conservation. But the work that I did, I studied ex animals extinctions, and this is why I use the models. We try to predict what would happen uh, in ecosystems where um, extinctions are happening and so on. So there is a, um, uh, a um, how do I say, a conservational comp component to the output of my work. But uh, to, to your question, I would say that having this um, such uh, this computational um, part being documented and open and shared is important because of the um, of the trust that it brings to the work, where mm -hmm. people can actually check and um, evaluate how it is that you're making claims. For example, okay these species, they are going to go extinct in the next hundred years or so, or this species is at the brink of extinction. It is um, important that whoever it is, it's either the public or other scientists or um, whoever the, the stakeholders are, that they can um, understand how it is your work and not just think, okay, you put put these numbers into some black hole of of mm -hmm. mathematical magic, and then you come with these predictions which are not grounded in reality. So, and this is something that it's not, um, it, it's something that is recognized, especially in the field of computational ecology. There is mm -hmm. this whole um, uh, work by uh, Volker Krim and co collaborators where they, they, they push for this principle of uh, traceability, where there's this whole framework for, okay, justify your scientific question, inform it well, uh, track all the data that you use to base your questions or the data used to base your, your, your hypothesis, how you built your experiments or anything and how you verify your results. 
So, mm -hmm. and this, and the idea is this, that it is understandable, not only for the scientists, as I said, who are going to probably reuse or work, mm -hmm. but for um, the public who has to understand, okay, the biology of the question is, okay, I have species going extinct, or I have um, some ecosystem that is um, threatened. And what it means when I go in with a model with something completely with something abstract, when I make experiments with it, mathematical experiments, and I bring out these numbers, how it is that I can trust that they relate to the to the mm -hmm. to the reality. So the, the if you have this well documented, you I mean, of course, there, it requires some work. It's not like it's popular science is different. Mm -hmm. But it, it allows specialized people um, in, in different degrees of um, uh, knowledge, I would say, about the, the field. So you don't, you don't have to be a computational scientist. You don't have to be strictly uh, a computational science, scientist. I mean, you don't have to be strictly uh, an ecologist. You can still follow the reasoning and build some questions and mm -hmm. then discuss, have some ground for discussion. And mm -hmm. of course, there is always going to be some aspect that is very particular, some statistical model that is quite hard to, to grasp, but at least it's documented, you know, mm -hmm. it's not um, just some assumption that you made and that you stretch a bit here or there to make it look um, mm -hmm. significant or, or uh, or relevant, or uh, how do I say, or a very drastic claim that brings attention to your work. You know, it's mm. um, you make your work. Um, like rigid. A, yeah. It's not. It's then rigid and um, reliable, basically. Because yes, exactly. Have, yeah. So, mm -hmm. so yeah. could this also be applied to climate research, to you know, to model climate scenarios? Like yeah, I would imagine. Um, I, I, I'm, yes. I mean, in, in, in theory, yes. I, I think the climate models they're quite they're much bigger. So mm -hmm. I, I, and in this sense, I mean that it's not mm -hmm. like you can take up your with your personal computer and run that model, and you're going to get the same results. You probably need some more powerful machines. But the idea would be pretty much the same that mm -hmm. you you can document okay what are my assumptions where is the code that i ran and then if someone wants to scrutinize it they would be able to do it mm -hmm. and this is also something that i incorporated in 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 this kit that i wrote where mm -hmm. it, it's not necessary that you have to put all the code inside there because as i said sometimes the code is too heavy even mm -hmm. my own code needs some um high performance clusters to run, but you point to it and then you mm -hmm. point exactly what are the outputs of that brand that you that you bring back in your in your so that's um, the level of fair fair research. Um, so where fair data comes into play where it's not only findable and accessible, but also interoperable and therefore then eventually reusable yeah. in a packaged form and basically in your own personal or professional notebook, which is easy to handle, even for non data scientists, like as I am, um, yeah. with a minimal understanding of coding languages and syntax, as you also described. So what is what is the computation aspect of your notebook based on? I see that you, um, you use Markdown and Markdown syntax in RStudio, which even I understand <laughs> to some extent. And again, like I, I just have basic knowledge of HTML and then through some, you know, some work in GitHub or um, yeah, just networking really and, mm -hmm. and documenting on GitHub, I've learned about Markdown, which is very similar. And that's where it ends for me, but also mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't have to design or, or work with code, but um, but it doesn't go much further than that, right? Mm -hmm. For for the notebook that you've created or designed for your colleagues. Yeah. So actually, the the notebook it I I wrote it for two um, for two text editors, you would say. One of them is um, our notebooks, or which uses the R Markdown syntax language, and also and this can be used when people are programming in R and Python. 
which are mm -hmm. quite um, popular in um, biology and ecology. But also I use the Pluto uh, notebooks, which are mm -hmm. for Julia language. And the idea of using R notebooks and Pluto notebooks is that, yes, they have this, comp this um, you can use the R markdown syntax, which is what is nice that you can have normal descriptive text and code embedded into it. So the idea that you can describe the code in a block of text or um, give some introduction to the code that is not commented, um, uh, is not comment code nah, mm. uh, in the script and also have the blocks of code for immediately followed by their, their output, be it um, plots or tables or summarizing values. But they are, they're also quite, uh, they're relatively easy to use so both our notebook, which you can open on, on our studio and the Pluto notebooks, they, they have this visual interface where you immediately see your file with the combination of the strict uh, descriptive text, the code and the output of code, you can see it uh, live. So it's not like you have to compile and then have another file being produced to see the output of your code. So you ha they have this, both of them, they have this very nice interfaces where it's relatively easy to see, okay, how is it that I put a, a block of text in this document? How is it that I put a block of code here? Mm -hmm. Where is my output coming? So it's, um, for, especially for the be beginners where this yeah. idea of our markdown of Markdown, sorry, language, where it might be a bit overwhelming. It might sound like another language where it's like, okay, I have to learn R, now I have to learn Markdown as well, and I need to find something to convert it to HTML. So these two are notebooks and um, uh, plural notebooks. They, they have this very um, visually um, appealing and easy to use um, interfaces where people can see right away, okay, I'm writing this code. If I press enter and it runs, I see my, my, my output. I see if it makes sense or not. Mm -hmm. I see if it might take too long. It might not make sense to include it here. I see my figures immediately. And oh, what is also nice uh, is that all the trials that you might do, okay, should I run this analysis or this test? And then I see the output, but immediately after I can do a check of, another idea that I had to check some, some detail of my question, for example, and you can still have it in the document, mm -hmm. you still have it in your R, note, in your R notebook uh, file or in your not, uh, Pluto notebook file, but mm -hmm. when you render it, so when you convert it to HTML, so to say, which is the visually appealing uh, version where you can read um, through and through, um, you can hide those things. So you can still have your side ideas or side projects in that file, but not necessarily show them. You just keep that as a note to yourself that, okay, I tried this thing, it didn't work, but I'm keeping it here just for future reference or, or something oh. like this. Cool. So yeah, that's basically for transparency also to ourselves as yes. researchers. Yeah. There's also a scheme or a comic that one of my colleagues, Julia Collin, developed like where a researcher is basically complaining to another scientist, um, like, oh, I can't read that code anymore, or even the server what's written in that lab notebook. And then, oh, have you tried calling the, the authors or have you tried um, getting in touch with the person? I was like, yeah, that was me a couple of years ago. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. This is something that actually came in the review process. Many of the reviewers actually said, you can actually include in there that researchers themselves would, would benefit from such a system because it's, it, it's not uncommon to waste quite some time to go back and realize, okay, what, what, what was I thinking yeah. when I was doing this? And this is the thing, this is something that I went through through my master's and PhD and, um, yeah, I, at some point you have to find a solution. Yeah, what I also like about the paper because it suggests a super simple folder structure. And when you see it in front of you, it's like, yeah, that's how I would do it. But no, really, we all haven't done it. It's, yeah. it's simple if you see it in front of you, but 
like as I think it's because everybody's just jumping jumping into the research mm -hmm. you have a question and it gets more and more complex by the day yeah. and then the documentation part takes takes a bit of effort and time and it's so vital for to the process so mm -hmm. I cannot I cannot <laughs> um, express too much or basically yeah that how important it is to have a thorough research plan which which should be followed along it doesn't have to be fixed throughout so of course there's room for flexibility and adjustments or the pro depending on how the project goes and you can also totally change the plan and the process but just to have a plan in mind and work along it and then document the heck out of it yeah <laughs> yeah, the yeah. Book, but um, and the idea and was, was yeah. yeah, and, and, and the idea about this folder structure, like you said, there are many times where I created this folder structure, like manually making my mm -hmm. folders, like, but the, the thing about the kit is that once you run the function, it establishes that it, it, it creates that those folders for you inside that structure. So this is like one line of code that you have to run and it's mm -hmm. named and everything. And also, as I said, as I say in the paper, the like you say, the documentation part, it takes a lot of time. And this is why we try to go for this simpler starter kit, because we don't want to give researchers even more work. I mean, it's necessary work, but we all know like how crazy, busy researchers usually are, especially mm -hmm. early career ones. And the idea uh, for this kit is by having this notebook, either the, the Armarco version or the Pluto version, is that it can store all your thought proce process. And we give some references in the paper as to some, some other people who suggest how to keep it, keep it up, how to structure the file itself. But the idea is that you have that single uh, document where you store all your ideas, your code, your trials, and um the tribulations with your work and then let's say you you can transfer from there some bits that are going to the main text of the publication either be bits of text let's say for example descriptions of uh, of analysis or figures and tables but the rest stays in there and can be, can, it, the, 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 the the file can be given as a as a supplementary information for the reader Mm -hmm. So it's it's a second it's it's very much um, you don't need to provide single figures and tables several files you give that whole thing the the figures will be named the, the you can give uh, captions to all of them mm -hmm. and then you it you it reduces the amount of like we were saying like the amount of files that you're handling where you're like okay figures supplementary figure one version a version b and so or something like this you mm -hmm. keep everything in there and um, you render it at the at the end of the of your work it also in both cases we explain more in detail how it's you can also inform what is the computational environment that you use so all about the 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 operating system and the packages and uh, software that you might have used for that analysis. So that is also preserved. And then when people uh, receive your work, they can also um, reuse it and establish the same conditions that you had to, mm. to run your analysis. And mm, yeah, so the, the, this idea of making things simpler and the, as I said, the minimal amount of work possible was very strong from the beginning because mm -hmm. I think we even might have had some discussions that this was something that people that uh, reviewers of the fellowship program said from the beginning that it was like okay there are quite a few tutorials already let's see what this one brings um, as a um, why is why this yet another one is important and I think this is where we and I think no, I, I mean this is where we went with it to make it yeah simpler not only to to write code and document code but to integrate it into the publication process because this is where things have to be polished and understandable right mm, yeah exactly and integrate. also also many notebooks that i've seen and so, pardon, so used 
as you said, they're super complex because they try to fit in many possible scenarios and complexities, also for medical research, bioscience, big data analytics, whatnot. Yeah. But like, and then there is not really a product for most researchers in early career like this one. Um, but maybe can we say a few words about scalability? So we said you said that the folder structure is kept simple. Mm -hmm. The functionality is kept as simple as possible and now how scalable is it how how to what extent can it be complexified if that's even a word <laughs> or would like would somebody who needs more complexity than what's presented here would they then need to go to another system or can it be expanded in some way well i'm as I said, for example, I'm thinking of the the because the, the if we if we think of the what the the, the, the notebook is supposed to contain is mm -hmm. some descriptive text for what you're doing, the code mm -hmm. that you run for it, and the output, right? Mm -hmm. So I think things can get complex depending on the data that you're using, the amount of data where you're getting it from. Mm -hmm both, so the amount and the, the sources, and also the size of the code and the language that you're using. So this, as I said, was focused on R, Python, and Julia. Mm -hmm. And I know at least for, for R, there, there's some uh, packages that allow you running C++ code. Mm -hmm. And I think you can, you could, as I say, you could integrate some lines of code in your notebook saying, okay, now we run this very big script or this very big model, but it's not going to be totally included in the, in the document. In the, mm -hmm. the, the whole code is not going to be literally copied and pasted, pasted mm -hmm. there, but there is a pointer to it. Mm -hmm. And this is where the point is, this is where the part where the scalability might come into place that, as I said, it's not like, a user that receives your notebook will be able to run that and run your model and get it back the same mm -hmm. results. There might be some issue with accessibility to the code or to a big machine to run it, mm -hmm. but at least the pointer is there. Yeah. So uh, this would be one um, way of working around it, I would say. And mm -hmm. as for the data, um, we always have the issue of um, confidential data, right? Data can, that cannot be shared. And again, it would be pointed in the in the paper that um, how that data was manipulated. Um, of course, um, you would, the, again, the, the reuser would probably not be able to rerun the, the notebook and get the same results because they don't have the data, they don't have access to it. Mm -hmm. But the idea is at least that the reasoning behind it, all the 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 the, the wrangling that goes around the the, the analysis, the, the transformation that happens that it can be followed. Mm -hmm. So I, I see this idea as, as uh, the, this issue of sc scalability would be more um, a, a matter of, okay, the, the reuser might not be able to rerun it, reproduce it like li literally, but they will understand what you did. And the, the, this, this, um, this barrier of access, I would say, would be more in the an issue of confidentiality with uh, which I don't think we can um, sure don't have but, a workaround mm -hmm. and also the size of machines which has to be um, uh, set up I would say would have to be discussed with but even um, there are some some cases where uh, for example, I, I'm pretty sure uh, Pluto notebooks have it, and I'm pretty sure our, our studios have it, where you can um, run uh, the, the a, a notebook in a special environment. So in a, in a special environment is not the, the right word, but I'm missing it. But you can have access to some computational power online. So I'm specifically thinking of uh, binder, which is a, um, let me get you the, the right uh, term here. Mm, I think I've heard about it. Yeah, yeah. So it's, um, yeah, it's uh, an executable, executable, uh, execution, executable, sorry, mm -hmm. environment. 
um, where you can depend on your calls, you can you can create the uh, this environment it, and it runs and it, it's remotely. So you can you get um, you you if your code is on is on a GitHub repository, you 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 plop it in there with the name to the to your notebook file, and then it creates uh, a Docker image. So uh, um, a computational reproduction, so to say, of your environment of the necessary um, what, what is necessary to run your notebook and then you're able to do it um, remotely so online. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 I'm pretty sure this would work for cases where the, the, the user cannot do it cannot do it on their own um, machine. Yeah. No, that's great. And I think it's, uh, yeah, as, as we said before, it's a prime example for fair data management, like using this kit basically sets you up for fairness, <laughs> as yep. in finding the accessible and operable and reusable. Mm -hmm. And even where it has its limits, it provides plugs for um, other systems to, to be connected with or yeah, to, to adapt, forward. so to say, yeah. Um, Which again comes back to that idea of making things simpler and yeah, be very good at being very simple. And then once people are comfortable here, they'll probably find a way of just plugging in the the, the more complex bits. Or um, mm. I think the yeah the, the the cases where this would happen will be much uh, would be not as numerous. Uh, as the cases where this simple simple uh, installment will be very useful, you know mm -hmm. what I mean. There, are, I think there are many people. There, are, the number of people that will benefit from having this simple kit that gets them started in doing uh, reproducible computational work is much higher than the people that are working with this very huge project. Mm -hmm. Where there, they are already uh, in the. They are already used to those practices anyway. Mm -hmm. This is something that we mentioned in the kit that mm -hmm. um, we don't talk about uh, building big uh, ecological models or big uh, mm -hmm. software uh, practices because the people doing this, they are already familiar with these practices anyway. Mm -hmm. So even our, um, even though, I mean, we want everybody to use this, but the, the idea here is really for the, the ones who are just starting so that they can be, feel comfortable and then they start making it their own. And as I explained, the, I think the kit gives a, a very uh, general uh, base where making it com more complex is not that, that complicated. It doesn't break anything, doesn't break, break any, any structure. Cool. And would this also be a useful um, as an electronic lab notebook to embrace for researchers who do not yet do any work with codes and algorithms, but might in the future, just to set themselves up for any possibilities of expanding their data processing? Like, would, would it be useful for like an ecologist or a like my like I was was I am trained in molecular biology and we never had large enough samples to do any sort of statistics really mm -hmm. because like it was more about qualitative analysis mm -hmm. but I still appreciate and like the folder structure and people might still work with code but not have to code themselves and then what I, where I'm trying to also head is that. Um, developing a code in, in academia tends or used to be um, not so, what's it say? Like the acknowledgements were scarce in the past, but now it's becoming more and more habit. And this is what I'm trying to um, foster in my trainings to acknowledge code development mm -hmm. and adding code developers also to the list of contributors or authors of a paper. Um, of course, it's always too, a matter of debate um, to what extent like the code help to come up with whatever conclusion, but and which then carries the message of the paper. But but basically, would it also enable to facilitate collaboration between like biologists and data scientists for a common goal or a joint project? Yeah, for sure. So um, because as I said, these these notebooks they contain descriptive text and code 
-hmm. but I mean, it can, it doesn't, it, it, it doesn't need to have a code mm -hmm. part for it. So you can think of these notebooks as your word file or a LibreOffice file where you would write your, um, your electronic notebook, as I said, mm -hmm. you have it, if you have it locally and, um, yeah, and the, the another um, reason why we used our Markdown in Pluto notebooks is because they are very easy to follow when you when you're uh, in under version control, right? So if you're mm -hmm. using GitHub to maintain your work, uh, it's very easy to to follow to see the where you change, so you can mark it very easily the lines that changed, and um, this is where the this aspect of um sharing your work with others is, is mm -hmm. becomes important and also making it uh, a form of electronic notebook because let's say you want to to log in your work every day you you would have every day the change that is happening and then you have a if you mm -hmm. want if you need to go back to justify for some reason to someone when a decision was made or anything you, you would have that in your version control we don't go in into detail into the version control um, aspect of it but we provide references as i said mm -hmm. and also um, yeah so sharing it with um, data scientists would be uh, uh, this is part of uh, this is pretty common the use of such notebooks is pretty common in, in data scientists so i think it would be they'll be happy to to do it Mm -hmm. um, and another thing that you said about uh, acknowledging code is also something that, I mean, we don't mention it directly in um, R, but we t in, in our um, kit, in our paper, but it's something that um, as you have this notebook and you have, for example, let's, let's say there's a, a very specific piece of code that you wrote that you say, okay, this is my baby child that I created, you can put that thing separately in, Z in Zenodo, for example, publish, mm -hmm. get a, a DOI for it and mention it in the notebook. And then when people reuse it, they will see that that has been deposited somewhere mm -hmm. and then you can get credit for it. So it's not like it's hindering any, it's not like you would say, okay, I, I, I developed this very nice piece of code and now people are just coming in and use it without technology. No, you can still make it a, a module, a separate module, so to say, mm -hmm. of, your, of your work that you get people to, to acknowledge. And we also oh. talk a bit about Zenodo in the paper. Yeah. So the Markdown um, language allows for, and you know, also probably the R um, syntax. Sorry, when I nomenclature goes Ori, but um, so it allows for version control, and you can also try who contributed what. Does it allow for more than one person to work in the notebook? Yeah, I mean, if you if you have a, a GitHub repository, for example, and I think. There might be even services. I'm not sure on this one, but there might be services of for uh, by, from our studios where you can contribute to the file at the same time. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not sure, but there might be. But in any case, with the classical form of having a GitHub mm -hmm. repository where you do your changes, you share it, and you send to other people, as long as they have um, our studio uh, either locally or um, Remotely, they can access and edit mm -hmm. it and document their chains. So it's it's the R markdown. It's pretty much markdown. It's only that is there is some, I would say, even uh, some um, easy um, how do you say shortcuts that you can use in R Studio. So for people who are familiar with markdown, it's pretty much the same thing. Yeah, cool, great. Oh, is there like a dream use case or like a wish that you have like where where you would like to see this come to use i mean obviously probably like it's 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 proving useful as it's been documented so i don't have any doubt like how can we like yeah what what's necessary to get it to as many people who might find it useful and then also implement or how has it been so far? I think we talked about this also on the last episode, but since we spoke, it's been half a year or so. Um, how's adoption going? And what can anybody out there who's listening do to support the project and to support 
bringing this to use rather? Like well, I think, um, first of all, is something that I always say is like, just take this one small step and try it and see like mm -hmm. the, the, this is especially true for, um, for people that are not so much into coding yet. They think, oh, okay, this is too much. It, it's mm -hmm. going to prove useful. And as I said, this is, has been distilled to be very simple. And I think what would make it useful, it useful is people um, using it in their, for their research and then publishing with that structure. So as, as we suggest to publish the, the, this whole thing as um, either on Zenodo or either or on GitHub mm -hmm. and quote it and, and cite it and say, okay, this is organized following our paper. And I think, I think as soon as it, if people if people start to see it uh, coming up in in reviews and people receiving papers to review with mm. this very neat uh, structure, this will help very much. And of course, I mean, using it and and um, spreading the word that it's, mm. it's always nice. But I think people uh, seeing the final product product and as a not only my 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 stuff being published like this, but others that used it and cited. Mm -hmm would be a very nice um, uh, way of making it popular and um, spreading it around. And this is the idea is just to, is to make um, people's um, workload um, as handleable as possible, yeah. Yeah, I mean, in the title you say it's to, it's to improve openness and also efficiency and okay just maybe let's find it's obvious to you and us and probably also most of the users but just as we mentioned um documentation is always tedious it takes a lot of time so how does the toolkit increase productivity and i mean yeah just for just so repeat the no-brainer or yeah yeah sure uh, sure um, so the productivity aspect comes um, with the this having a single file, as I said, that mm. has all the codes, all your trials, all your uh, figures, your tables, everything is in a single code. If you're not happy with something, you just comment it out. And then when you convert it to the HTML version, which is the great more readable and uh, friendlier version it gets um, hidden so you, you can um, sort of say hide the pieces that you're not so uh, you can keen focus on sharing on, yet yeah and it's a thing while Sorry? adding the you can you can as you for a presentation for example you can yes. show an audience the essence of the work or the the um eye appealing front end yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but adding all the the code stuff, yeah, <laughs> this might be a or even, yes, or that. something that I would uh, often happen would that I would have to verify one or two details of of um, an analysis or something, but they were mm -hmm. not so relevant to other people, or and then I would just hide those, but I would still keep it in there in case they ever become useful. So um, going back to your question, so having a single file where you mm -hmm. have all this, the descriptive text, the code, the figures and the tables. This is already an aspect that I think it's uh, useful because it's easy to organize. You can, if you need to find some analysis, you just use the, the search function and you look through your file to see, okay, when was it that I did, you know, my, 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 my T test on my temperature variable or something. And, um, and that being um, from that single file, you can you can take those pieces that are useful for the main text. So let's mm -hmm. say you're running a code uh, for an analysis. You can write a brief text describing, okay, this analysis does this, this, and that. And then you leave it in that text. You get the graph, you get the plot out of it, you get some summarizing table. And if at any point it becomes useful for you to move those things to the main text, it's uh, you can just from one file, you transfer to the other and, and also back. So let's say there is a piece of your methods that don't make sense to be in the main text. You can put them in the supplementary text followed by the code and 
the output, which is the plot or the tables. And as I, we, we detail in the in the paper and in the in the videos, if you need the 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 the, the plots and the tables that you produce with this file, don't have to appear in there if they are already in the main text. You just you can just make a note that okay, mm -hmm. this produces like you 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 create the figure. Of course, you just don't show it in the in the file, mm -hmm. and the the reader will understand it. Um, Yes, and also the the productivity comes on the short term with this, but on the long term, as I said, with you being able to go back to your work and re and understand it relatively easy. If you have to hand it out, hand it over to a colleague or a student or um, uh, whoever, the onboarding pr process becomes easier, right? Because people know mm -hmm. what is happening and. Um, yeah, this is where um, I see the productivity coming in, mm. the, the most critical point, I would say. The usage tutorial is already published also on the Nodo, so we will also link them to the show notes. So whoever is interested now in testing it, please go sure. ahead. Mm -hmm. um, do you also have webinars lined up where, or, or talks and seminars where you present the toolkit? where we can point listeners to, or is the idea for this to be, we've already prepared it to be self-explanatory. Yep. Um, so will you spend more time on this in the future? I'm not saying you should, you could. Yeah. And it's probably also fun, but, yeah. um, but knowing that you're also busy with, with your actual nowadays work, mm -hmm. and this is a project that you've not concluded from the past with this paper. But yeah, what's the way forward for you being involved in this project? And um, and again, like we also at Access to Perspectives, we we'll give it a section on the website um, as a resource where people can always refer to and get also the tutorials and links to, to learn everything about it. But yeah, what's your involvement going to be for the future? Will it be approachable for any questions or? Yeah, um, for sure. So the the idea is that this is my um for now i don't i have not had yet any webinars where i explain it in detail and the idea of the videos is yes that it's self-explanatory but also that people can go back and re-watch it and check mm -hmm. it again okay where exactly do i click um mm -hmm. but yes if, of course if people want to to contact me about the uh, explaining it uh doing a another tutorial on it or doing uh, some webinar they can of course if they have suggestions um they can they can come to me um, we can always point it i mean i cannot change it so much because it's been published but we can always uh, there is a section in the in the repository of this uh, of this work where we have uh, suggestions of other uh, practice that people can establish so from mm -hmm. this very simple thing okay what could you do Mm -hmm. How can you, can you make it more complex or another ways of organizing? We can always link those in, in that repository. And um, people can also follow um, on ResearcherGate, I would say is, the, is the, the most, ResearcherGate and Twitter would be where I would announce any kind of uh, further develop in this sense. Mm -hmm. for the development sorry in this in, of this work so um, GitHub, probably, right? yes but i don't know how much uh github they would get the sense of uh announcing novelty of or oh, yeah. where is it let's say i have some because i'm I, i'm 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 part of some uh, open science networks for example mm -hmm. and sometimes those they organize webinars on specific things. I don't know how I could, I could announce those on, on, on GitHub, oh, but of course by, okay. by no, starting like, the... Yeah, no, when there is updates to the to the toolkit itself, then you will- Oh yeah, yeah. On GitHub, but, yeah, but otherwise, sure. yeah, for announcement is better in community channels for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So the mm -hmm. idea, so as I say, for now, there is nothing um, scheduled. But uh, as, as you said, I, I'm, I'm already pushing it in, in my work at IDIV. Um, and then, um, yeah, I'm of course open to, to any requests. As soon, if we manage the, to schedule it, I'm happy to do it. Mm. Nice. Thank you so much, Ludmilla. Thank you. It's been, it's been an honor like being part of, well, being part of a part of your journey with us. And uh, yeah, big, um, Kudos to the accomplishment and the paper now. Um, 
yeah and uh, listeners out there please take a look at the paper and also um the the love notebook itself it's beautiful it's nicely structured even if you don't want to jump on it right away but for sure you get some inspiration on how you can structure and better structure your research and maybe you will also find the trigger to test it for your own research project and work with the data scientists and leveraging your research project further for some yeah uh geeky data analysis <laughs> <laughs> yes um yeah so thanks a lot uh, again uh, joe for the for the mentoring and for the support afterwards as i said i also need to thank my my co-authors so cedric Scherer mm -hmm. and juliano Sarmento cabraus they they um they got along uh, after i i got into the the friars because they they also have their own um practices with dealing with um, people handling code and handling um, ecological work mainly, mainly but their their input and their contribution to the to the work was um, very useful so acknowledge them I didn't manage mention them during the the work where this was during our talk but this was definitely a, a joint effort and yeah so hope people find it useful and if you need if there are any questions just write me somewhere um, mm. and i will try to answer it yeah and it's also a good reminder that you mentioned uh, cedric and juliano like nobody is on this journey alone and and it's it's always been always beneficial to work together to yeah. produce um a meaningful research project, a meaningful research project facilitating computational notebook in your case. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, and then, and this is, I think, also the beauty with research itself that it's most, yeah, to the most part, if not always, about collaboration and gaining knowledge and sharing knowledge. And you provide a beautiful um, sample and infrastructure for that. So thank you again for. For that product thank you so yeah see you soon hopefully yes see you <laughs>